you would like to look back and make a comparison, if there is any, between being uh, a dean uh, of global affairs and public policy and being a minister of foreign affairs uh, of Egypt, if you could find any kind of comparisons. And I need a follow-up after that, if you would allow me. My problems I'm not used to being, to being for a minister yet, so I tend to say what immediately comes to my mind, but I won't this time, because it will get me into trouble, not with the foreign minister, but with you. Uh, seriously speaking, I, when, when Lisa hired me to become dean, I knew nothing about being dean, frankly. Uh, hadn't worked in academia, was challenged by a new environment, and at the same time had to build something that didn't exist. It was her idea, but she tasked me to do it, and that's even more difficult if it, than if it's your idea, because you can claim that was what you intended to build. Uh, I was very happy to work on the, the School of Global Affairs. And if there's anything that's common, frankly, is that I'm being handed the job of foreign minister, the minister at a time when Egypt is trying to redefine itself. Redefine who it is. Our society is searching for answers. Who are we? I mean, Egypt is neither me nor is it an Islamist. It's both of us. And it's others, by the way. And we have to find a way to find that face. Uh, the world is changing, as I tried to explain. And we have to determine a foreign policy. And uh, I have to say, what, what really helped me in this new job that I learned here at AUC. Having been a professional diplomat, we were very used to coming out and making statements, policy statements, and as, as foreign minister, we even do more of that. You don't really bother to explain why, or what's the background of that. I went into a rather long presentation today because I, what I had in mind that this was an academic institution and that I had to explain why we need to do what we wanted to do. So this, the novelty of trying to build something new, frankly, I find common between my, my challenge uh, four years ago and the challenge we're facing now. The other thing is that Egypt, Egypt generally is as lively as AUC was when I was here. The police is laughing because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> A follow-up question is, in, at, the U, at the AUC you had the provost, the president, and sometimes maybe the chairman of the board of trustees. If you apply that in Egypt, we have the president, the prime minister, and maybe another board of or chairman of board of trustees. Who the most that you advise, you get advice from, or you report to? That's a great question. I've been asked that question by many of my foreign friends as well. And it's a serious question. Yeah. I know you always like to sort of pick and choose, but I mean, it is a serious question. Okay. That's part of the challenge as we try to establish a political system, each one of us is learning what exactly the role is. So I've been brought up in the system. So naturally, I report to the president. I will also brief the prime minister on different issues. But what I was never brought up and never trained to do is that I have to report to the public three, four times a day. And on all the television channels, uh, not necessarily myself, but the public exposure Continuous exposure is really draining. But frankly, if we're going to build a democracy, and democracies are messy, we have to learn how to operate in an open society. So that's really my greatest challenge, how to report to the public. To the government officials, our institutions are still working, although we're changing this new constitution. We'll shift the powers of the president from the president to the prime minister, although foreign policy and national security will remain mostly with the president. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me open the floor for questions and answers, and if you would allow me, I'm going to take right and left, front and back, so like try to rotate as much as possible, and uh, if you would please be uh, very brief when you uh, make your question, or even a comment that is as brief as possible. We have two microphones, I believe, here that we can take it, so I think the gentleman over there, the first to raise his hands, yes, back there, yeah. Could you please introduce yourself as well? Uh, well, for the benefit, I'm not sure if you have a translation. Yeah, we have simultaneous. Okay, go ahead. All right, I can speak English. 
better in English just because some, some of our guests here do not have the headphones to do the interpretation, but it's, it's okay. fine, we could manage it. Uh, my name is Suhail Saleh, I'm a journalist from El Murad, the news website, and I will ask uh, Mr. Nabil Fahmi about what's happening in El Qur, in Ukraine, and what's his opinion about Vladimir Putin? This is the first. The second, excuse me, uh, I want to know how the country and how the regime will deal with Brotherhood Group in the second in the next period. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Uh, should we take some questions and, and return it back? Yes, please. Uh, for here. Your Excellency, I would like to ask what would be your answer in the coming few days at the United Nations in Geneva regarding all the problems we're facing over there. Okay, thank you. Uh, here we'll take another question. Uh, yes. Uh, the gentleman here in the middle, I saw him raising his hands too, too long ago. Yes. Cornelius Lossman, Arab West Report Center for Arab West Understanding. Uh, Your Excellency, you were speaking about partnerships, and of course, you're going through great challenges in Egypt, and uh, it's important to build partnerships with different countries, but what about the many millions of, uh, I'm European, uh, I've been living here since 78, but, but uh, in Europe, in the US, in other countries in the world, that all be used if you build that network with NGOs, with private people who really love Egypt and try to support it, how to do it. Thank you. And I'll take one more here, and then we'll go to the Foreign Minister. Uh, please, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I mentioned the gentleman in the back. I will, I will come back to you in the next round. Yes. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, your question. Thank you. The question is about reunification. Is it possible reunification of Sudan with Egypt? Uh, I think it also would be a reunification between Sudan and Egypt themselves. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. Thank you, Thank you Father. Let, let me deal with these questions in inverse order. Uh, because I want to emphasize Sudan and, and South Sudan. At the beginning of my tenure here, not the one signed yesterday, but the one six months ago, uh, there was a lot of engagement with the world about what's happening in Egypt, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. And I remained in town until I, until I went to Sudan. And I was criticized. Why wasn't I going to Europe to argue with this or argue with that? But I insisted on going to Sudan and South Sudan first. To give a message both to Egyptians and to the Sudanese that our strategic interest and priority has to be Sudan and Africa. And frankly, my sense was they were quite attracted by the idea that Egyptians give that much importance to Sudan. The fact that we didn't for so many years is one of the mistakes I think we've made in the past. Now, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, I can't imagine that we would be unified again in the formal sense, but if we just develop a greater sense of cooperation between ourselves, whether it is regarding issues of water or just uh, the whole paradigm of international relations. I think that's imperative. There's, not, there's no way we or the Sudanese or frankly any of the Nile Basin countries can achieve their full potential without cooperation. Uh, so will we get closer? Yes. Will there be ups and downs? Uh, yes. But uh, as long as I'm dealing with foreign policy, Sudan will be a priority issue whether it is north or south. And uh, as a, a compliment to what I just said, I mean, I've gone in six months to at least six or seven African countries again to emphasize 
the importance of this. Partnerships with the NGO community around the world. I'm serious about saying we're building a new Egypt here. It's not the same Egypt. And we're going to have to learn how to contribute to defining the international agenda, not react to an agenda that's out there, but we need to be able to bring out, rationalize, present our positions. And we're going to have to respect the international norms that are agreed upon internationally. We're not going to live in isolation from the world. So it's going to be a, a, a balancing act, uh, an orientation between the world getting more used to us, not only about the pyramids and the pharaohs, about the youth, what, who th what they think, what they like. Uh, and as we do that, we're going to be more global, more international in the years to come, and that will require us to not only have inclusive domestic policies, but also accept to have inclusive international policies. In other words, be part of the international system and allow the system to be part of us. Um, the NGO community, in the larger sense, will be a major player in that. And I don't think it will be a problem once openness in Egypt settles uh, on the right uh, pillars. Problems with the UN in Geneva, I assume you're talking about the Human Rights Commission, unless there's other parts I'm not aware of, which uh, uh, that's at least what's coming up in March. Look, I'm very candid about what we're doing, what I do, and what we don't do. Uh, where I think things need to be explained better, I do. Where I think people are misrepresenting what's happening in Egypt, I do that very openly. Where I think they're holding double standards and forgetting their own history, I mentioned it and I've done that with European foreign ministers on all of my trips. Anybody who tries to give me the impression that transformations happen, without ups and downs, I'd simply go back to their own history and mention that. But again, we are committed to human rights. If there are mistakes, we will correct them. But the world has to understand we're going through a societal transformation. This is not about changing one president or the other, although given our rate, changing two in three years is quite a bit. But it's more than that. It's about changing me, changing you. And that will require engagement. But I'm not going to be pushed around by anybody who does so only because of their national interests. Believe me, that's not what I do. Um, how will we deal with the Muslim Brotherhood? It's a great question. Absolutely great question. Muslim Brotherhood members, the individuals themselves, most of them are Egyptians. And they will remain Egyptians. And we will continue to strive to find a way so that if they're peaceful, if they accept to be, to, to be part of Egypt, it's an inclusive society, not one that simply includes them or only includes me. We will continue to work with them according to our constitution and according to the objective of trying to develop a democratic state. But we will not accept violence. We will not accept exclusive politics. And we will deal with, and as for now as a movement, it is formally a terrorist organization. But the, the members themselves are Egyptians, and that's really where the target is. Anyone who's peaceful, who wants to build a modern Egypt, will gradually find his role. No matter how strong you may think, if you're violent or want to keep it to yourselves, we will take you on. On the Ukraine and, and uh, President Putin, look, it's in many ways, it's similar to things that have been happening in our age. It's both an internal issue that relates to issues of governance, and it's a geopolitical issue at the same time. There's, no one can argue that this is only about an internal revolution, given the stakes that involve America, Russia, Europe, and so on and so forth. But nobody can argue either that it doesn't have an internal component. So it's going to be complicated. Uh, I would hope that at the end of the day, uh, more violence is not used. I would hope that after the brinkmanship that uh, we may see uh, things will ultimately fall on the side of people being wise. Uh, this is not an era where 
indiscriminate use of force should be condoned. At the same time, one has to accept and understand it's very important to manage change in order not to end up throwing out the baby with the basketball. Uh, just a follow-up on one of the questions in regard to Sudan. Do you feel that the government of Sudan has let uh, us down or Egyptians down in regard to the crisis and the conflict with Ethiopia over the Nile River? And would Egypt accept their offer to be mediator uh, in this crisis? Well, the Sudanese say they have not let us down. The Sudanese say that they have not taken sides. But frankly, when the suggestion is made that Sudan is a mediator between Egypt and anybody else, then there's obviously a problem. I mean, I would think that the relations between Egypt and Sudan are much closer than for them to be a mediator between us and someone else. Um, can they come up with suggestions, compromise suggestions? Sure but not from the perspective of we're equidistant from two sides. And there is a general sense of concern uh, regarding the issues of Nile water in particular, but we will engage in dialogue with the Sudanese Foreign Ministry. It's actually coming tomorrow, we'll have meetings with them tomorrow. Uh, and there's no zero-sum game here. Either we will all gain from finding solutions or everyone will pay a price because no one, not one single country of the Nile Basin countries has enough now to satisfy their future demand, be that, be that water, energy, development, uh, and so on.